Yat A, Shio, hello, and welcome to the sixth presentation of our Indigenous Speaker Series. The Indigenous Education Institute, IEI, along with the San Juan Island National Historical Park and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, Heliophysics Education Activation Team, NASA HEAT, is proud and honored to present A Sense of Place, Indigenous Perspectives of Land and Sky. Our sixth speaker of the series is Dr. Henrietta Mann, who will be speaking today. The title of her talk is A Grandmother's Perspective. My name is Dr. Nancy Maryboy, and I'm the founding president of the Indigenous Education Institute. We are a nonprofit institution with an all indigenous board and staff. We have been in existence for 25 years. We are presently located in the San Juan Islands, Washington and on the Navajo Nation. Our mission is to preserve, protect and apply traditional indigenous ways of knowing to contemporary life with a focus on native education, environmental change, and sustainable healthy environments on earth, water, and skies. Much of our work concerns the creation of collaborations with integrity between Western science and tr traditional indigenous ways of knowing. I would like to begin our series today with a heartfelt acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of the world. Usually we acknowledge the land on which we are living or presenting, but in this day and age of virtual online realities, we are honoring indigenous people around the world. The presentation in this series, all of them have been chosen to reflect an awareness <clears throat> of the foundations of traditional thinking. In native ways, everything is interconnected. So rather than a specific focus on biology, astronomy, or other separate disciplines, we will be presenting worlds of interrelationships and processes of reciprocity. Another focus for this speaker series is expanding awareness and understanding for cultural differences to support more successful and diverse working relationships, whether it be in education, National Research Management, NASA, or museums. I want to thank you personally for attending this webinar. The interest you have shown is overwhelming. We have over 600 people registered from all across the United States, and we have participants from around the world, including Canada, Germany, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Russia, the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, etc. It is also interesting and heartwarming that we have more than 145 different tribes represented in our registrations for this presentation today. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. David Begay, Vice President of the Indigenous Education Institute, for a spiritual welcome. David? Thank you. Um... Dr. Mary Boy. Uh, I want to greet uh, everybody well. Nancy, you need to unmute for us to hear David. Given to me oh, uh, by my sure. elders that's been carried down through the generation. And I pick one of them uh, that will enable me and empower me to call in the spirits of the four directions so the, spirit, the spirits will be amongst us uh, as we gather here 
uh, to be a part of this presentation. Uh, I always think that we are gifted with a beautiful place on Mother Earth and a place in the universe as our home. It's really a beautiful gift to be a part of this place, a spirit of place and of time and space. And with that, I want to uh, use my spiritual tool to call in the spirit uh, from all directions. And so the spirit will be uh, amongst us as we uh, gather here uh, today. And so bear with me. I'll be uh, using my crystal that's going to go out to the spirit and then different, and it's going to come back. Uh, and so the sound and the vibration in our uh, way of teaching, there's sacred, sacred sound. And, and I just wanted to share that. I'll go to the east, the south, the west, and the north. She now, Cosby, Thank you very much, David, for that lovely welcome. This presentation and all of the um, all of the uh, events of our series, um, a sense of place, indigenous perspectives on Earth and sky, they're all being recorded and they can be accessed at the Indigenous Education Institute website shortly following the events. Um, give us about a week to get it up and you'll be able to uh, log into our um, uh, website, which will be listed at the end of this presentation, and you can go in and it's free. You can download this talk as well as the five other ones that have preceded Dr. Mann. Um, as you have re registered by email, we will also share notices to you for upcoming presentations. It is my greatest pleasure now to introduce our guest speaker and my dear friend and auntie, Dr. Henrietta Mann, whom we are very honored to have as a member of the IEI Circle of Elders. Dr. Henrietta Mann is a Cheyenne Indian who now lives in Oklahoma. I am not gonna to attempt to say her name correctly in Cheyenne, and I'm sure she will say it um, uh, after this introduction is over. Uh, for Dr. Mann, stressing the importance of education has been a lifelong mission. At a very young age, he developed a passion for learning that blossomed into an unrelenting quest to promote education for natives and non-natives alike. 
and led to a career of teaching at the pre-college, community college, undergraduate and graduate levels. Dr. Mann is the last remaining founding member of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society Council of Elders, a distinguished group of dedicated individuals who provide cultural guidance and support to the entire ACES family. In 2012, Dr. Mann was recognized with the Eli S. Parker Award, the highest ACES honor. She was director professor in Native American studies at the University of Montana, Missoula for some 28 years. In 2000, she became the first individual to occupy the cats and down chair in Native American studies at Montana State University in Bozeman, where she was professor emerita and also special assistant to the president from 2003 to 2016. Dr. Mann was the founding president of the Cheyenne and Arapaho Tribal College in Oklahoma. In 2016, she became one of two Native Americans ever to be elected to the National Academy of Education. In 2018, she was elected to membership in the American Academy of Arts and Scientists, Sciences. Here's a fun fact. In 1991, Rolling Stone magazine named Dr. Mann as one of the 10 leading professors in the nation. Dr. Mann continues to serve on boards at the national and international levels. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce my auntie and friend, Dr. Henrietta Mann. Henrietta, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, I, that Thank little you. red line would not disappear. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Nancy. And it is a beautiful day here in Oklahoma, and I hope it is just as beautiful wherever you are in this world. I greet you today from the home of the red people now known as Oklahoma. And at this moment, I would like to give a land acknowledgement, recognizing this home of indigenous peoples known by many as grandmother or mother earth, a loving spirit being who anchors our human spiritual roots deep in the sacred soil of her body. This island home of Ayers stretches from the eastern waters of the Atlantic Ocean across the continent west to the Pacific Ocean and from the south direction to the north direction under an expansive covering of blue sky. This land now called the United States of America is the ancestral home of indigenous peoples. In our language, indigenous peoples is that is who we are as the diverse Native American nations, indigenous nations of this land, meaning the natural, ordinary, people of this land. The United States of America, our ancestral home, was our grandparents first. And we have lived long on this earth. But today we currently share this island home of Ayers with multitudes of peoples who immigrated here emigrated, they came here from the four directions of the world. Now we are home to approximately 330 million peoples and more want to come to this land 
of freedom, democracy, and in asylum. I think of those little children who are walking alone to the south border. At this moment, I would like to especially thank my niece again, Dr. Nancy Mary Boy, Dr. Nisi Nancy, who honored me by asking me to be the sixth speaker in this series. I also wish to thank Vice President David Begay for the wonderful blessing that he gave to all 600 plus of us. What a wonderful, all encompassing way to honor those of you in the audience. I would like to also acknowledge Dr. Polly Walker, the chair of the Indigenous Education Institute and the other esteemed members of the Indigenous Education Institute Board of Directors. And finally, I would like to also acknowledge the other members of the IEI Circle of Elders. And finally, of course, I thank all of you who have chosen to participate in this gathering, one session of A Sense of Place, or Indigenous Perspectives on Earth, Water, Mah, and sky will. I thank all of you who have chosen to participate in this gathering, those of you sitting out in the four great directions of the universe to attend this gathering, one session of a sense of place, indigenous perspectives on earth, water, and sky. This hour will reflect my 86 year life journey around this earth circle that began along the Washita River in Western Oklahoma or Western Indian Territory as this place was once called. And I have walked for 86 years under the massive dome of the blue sky. I would like to acknowledge that I am an extension of the Washita River that we call the Lodge Pole River. It was a winter camping ground and when the Cheyennes would leave to make their spring and summer visits to other places on this earth. They would take their long lodge poles that they gathered from the, that valley and lean them against those tall trees that bordered the lodge pole river or the Washita. And they would leave them there. And when they would come back to their winter encampment, which was a very nice camping place, they would take their lodge poles and erect their ordinary dwelling that we call the teepee today. But this or the Washita River looms large in Cheyenne and Arapaho history, as does Sand Creek in current state of Colorado today. At each place, at the Washita, and before that, for four years prior to that, at Sand Creek, United States soldiers unleashed a surprise dawn attack upon Black Kettle's camp. Black Kettle is recognized as the most peaceable of all Cheyenne peace chiefs. And my family was a member of his band. 
Chief Black Kettle, Mohdavadur, signed three treaties of peace and friendship with the United States of America. John Milton Shevington is a name that is associated with Sand Creek. Shevington was a Methodist minister, become soldier, and he led the Colorado Third Cavalry at the Sand Creek Massacre. Black Kettle flew a United States flag and a white flag of truce from a tall lodge pole at his camp along Sand Creek in Colorado Territory. Nonetheless, the military violently attacked and engaged in heartless mutilations of the dead Cheyenne and Arapaho, primarily women and children. Fetuses were cut from the wombs of their mothers. Genitalia were cut from the men and the women. Some of them were used as hat bands, saddle horn covers to adorn their bridles. And the bloodless third carried their human trophies in parade as they marched back into what was then Denver City and the Cheyenne and the Arapaho body parts were put on display at the Apollo Theater and in some of the local saloons. How can one ever forget Sand Creek? Four years later, Black Kettle's people were again subjected to the ruthlessness of the military as they were settled into their winter encampment along the Lodge Pole River in Indian Territory. This time, the boy general of the Civil War, George Armstrong Custer, led the men of the 7th Cavalry against Black Kettle's camp. Regrettably, Black Kettle and his wife were killed that day. And as Custer and his men earlier that day waited for dawn to attack Black Kettle's sleeping village, the dark night suddenly became as bright as day. Custer initially thought it was a Cheyenne signal that they had been discovered. However, it was a star that glowed brilliantly in the night sky. Ben Clark, chief scout for Custer, said that Custer called it the star of the Washita and that it predicted his victory. Kate Bighead, one of our Cheyenne women historians, referred to him, to Custer, as the son of the morning star. However, in his book entitled Washita, Jerome A. Green, in a footnote, quoted Mort Wegman French, explaining this event. He said, modern astronomical calculations indicate that what Custer and his men saw very likely was Mercury which in its celestial orbit was especially bright on November 27th, 1868. Venus, often referred to as the morning star, had risen that day more than three hours before sunrise and so was already too far above the horizon to fit the historical description. This her, my maternal great-grandmother, and white buffalo woman, my paternal great-grandmother, were present 
in Black Kettle's encampments at both massacres. They survived to tell their stories of those two tragic events. Consequently, the Cheyenne and Arapaho collectively have a strong but a heartbreaking connection to Sand Creek and the Washita. I personally have a strong emotional attachment to these places because of the genocide and injustice that took place there. My grandmothers, along with others, lived to tell their stories of courage and survival. My grandfather, White Buffalo Woman's son, her youngest son, lived on his allotment about 15 miles downriver from the massacre site. And his allotment was along the Washita River. Four generations, eight people, lived in this small three room house. White Buffalo woman who reared my father from infancy prayed daily that she would live long enough to see his child. I was that child, the answer to her prayers. My father told me that the entire family was waiting when my mother and I came home from the hospital. And early the next morning, White Buffalo Woman, a respected midwife and healer, performed a baby pipe ceremony for me. At that moment, she stood at the center of the cosmos, holding my tiny body in her hands in the same way that men hold and offer their sacred pipes. She pointed my head to the southeast, to the southwest, to the northwest, and to the northeast, where the most holy Cheyenne spirit powers live. Ma'el, the great one, our creator, had created these four spirit powers to witness the act of creation and then directed them to their homes in the semi-cardinal directions of the universe, from where they continually watch over human beings and all life. They are still there. They are still looking over us and protecting us. As Ma Hill had said, protect these human beings whom I have created with my power to live on this earth. After acknowledging the four spirit powers, my great grandmother pointed my head up to the sky and then laid my tiny body on the earth, cushioning me in her loving hands. She had made my first blanket for me. It was a tanned buffalo calf hide. That was my first blanket, a little buffalo, a little calf hide. And then she offered a prayer after which she handed me to a family member and I was passed around the circle in a clockwise direction following the movement of the sun. Each person present held me, spoke to me, welcomed me to earth and wished me a good life journey. I'm sure someone wished me a long journey as well. This ceremony took place at my grandfather's home located beside the Washita River in Western Oklahoma. I want 
want for us to briefly look at what we Cheyennes call spiritual rootedness. Spiritual roots. We are rooted in this land in much the same way as a beautiful flower, a wonderful tree, the sweet grass, our rooted relatives. And at birth, Mott Hill, essentially a spiritual gardener, plants each of us in the earth where we grow our spiritual roots as we advance for, through the four stages of life. Initially, we are fragile baby plants who can easily be uprooted from our cultural ways and who require nurturing and loving care. And then as young people, we grow into flexible willow branches who are strengthened by, the, by learning the ways of the people, primarily the elders. Then as adults, we mature into strongly rooted cottonwood trees who protect and shelter the people. Finally, in old age, we become withered cottonwood branches whose teachings are thrown into the fire of life to strengthen, strengthen the ways and the hearts of the people. We are rooted in this sacred soil of our grandmother, the earth. Or you can't see our spiritual roots, but they are there and we can move them. We can repot them and move as many of our relatives have done into the cities of this country. Thus, on a May Day in 1934, White Buffalo Woman chose this place for Mott Hill to plant me, as one does a seed. From there, I grew through life, nurtured by the flowing water of the Wachita, the red earth the endless blue sky and the winds from the four directions. Today, only I remain. However, I often return to my grandfather's home place, as we used to call it, where it was to touch my past and to maintain my sense of place. It can make for a lonely experience at times. But for four years after I was born, White Buffalo Woman and I shared unconditional love with each other as she infused my spirit with timeless knowledge and hope, touching the interior landscape of my heart. And upon her departure to that eternal gigantic camp in the stars beyond the Milky Way, she left her son and grandson to pass her teachings on to me. My grandfather and my father would often preface their teachings with my mother said, or my grandmother said. She spoke to me through them. And as I grew, I heard and learned the many nighttime stories of the Cheyenne. Stories that usually begin with the phrase, if of it, 
Ivavit, meaning in the past of long ago. And of all the teaching stories, the ones about sweet medicine, Motsi'iyoi, are exceptionally important in terms of our sacred history as a people. Our elders say that the stories about him took place thousands of years ago and that he lived with them for 446 years, four very long lives of a person. If of it, in the past of long ago, it seemed that sweet medicine was being pulled to a mountain far to the north, which from a distance appears to be a reclining bear. It is a female mountain. We call that place Noah Wuss, Bear Butte, our teaching mountain, the giving hill, the place that gave us our way of life. Bear Butte sits on the periphery of the Black Hills in South Dakota. Noah Wuss is our teaching mountain from which our power as a people flows. It is the spiritual center of the Cheyenne universe. The Cheyenne and Arapaho people, as well as the Lakota and the Kiowa are attached to the sacred mountain that gave them their ways of life. New cultural beginnings and which provide and hold their identities as unique peoples. And for us as Cheyenne, we say that there within its hollow interior, which remembers the teepee, which resembles a teepee, all, all the spirit powers of the world gathered to teach sweet medicine. His teachers included the spirit of the sun, moon grandmother, earth grandmother or mother, water spirit sky spirit, spirit of the bear, bison spirit, eagle spirit, red tail hawk spirit, the rock spirit, and the spirits of sage, cedar, sweet grass, and countless more. All of the powers of the world taught sweet medicine our ways within this sacred mountain that resembles a lodge, no us, the hill that gives. And within that teaching mountain, sweet medicine learned our ceremonial ways, our traditional form of government, which is the council of 44 peace chiefs. Black Kettle, I have mentioned, was a member of this council. We were also, we also received our soldier society, protectors and providers from that place. Our tribal law ways and value system. Everything that makes us unique as the like hearted people, the people with the same hearts, the like hearts, because we were taught always to think with both our minds in our hearts. We are bound to the sacred land form individually and collectively. We are spiritually rooted in that place, Noahus, where the Cheyennes go to gather sacred paints used in our ceremonies, as well as to fast and pray to make offerings, seek direction for our hearts and our minds, renew our spirits, formalize ceremonial vows, or to tie prayer cloths. 
I am named for my paternal grandmother, Ho'oisto'ona, who is named for those prayer cloths, sometimes referred to as offering cloths. Thus, the English translation of our Cheyenne name is prayer cloth woman. Others make pilgrimages to Noah was just to see and walk on sacred ground and to show reverence and love for the earth and the rocks. It is heartwarming to visit our Cheyenne spiritual home to renew and strengthen the bond between person and place. Like so many others before me and those after me who have fasted there and who will go there to fast, I too have a place on the side of that female mountain, Bare Butte, Noah was. White Buffalo Woman, whose Cheyenne name is Wasta, was among the many who carried our teachings from the Northern Plain, homelands to the Southern Plains. She also made certain that her teachings concerning sweet medicine and our umbilical-like attachment to Bear Butte would become a part of the fabric of my life. Though the like-hearted people are now geographically separated into Northern and Southern Cheyennes, both groups have a common spiritual connection and abiding sense of place at Bear Butte. It is an awe-inspiring and spirit-filled moment when I initially see the sacred center of the Cheyenne universe, whether I travel from Montana or Oklahoma. My great-grandmothers were born on the Northern Plains, but were relocated to the South. Conversely, I was born on the Southern Plains and relocated to the North to teach in the two flagship universities of the state of Montana. My Northern Cheyenne relatives, the Morning Star people, share their hearts, their minds, their love and knowledge with me. A Buffalo hair rope woman, Hefadanit from the South. They wanted me to know of one of their warrior women named Buffalo Calf Road, who lived during the time when the United States was making treaties with the various Indian nations. Treaties, of course, we know were used to formalize the government to government relationship that we tenaciously hold to in our contemporary times. And those treaties were also documents and ways to acquire our lands, our ancestral homelands, our places. However, the federal government abruptly ended treaty making in 1871 and instituted its reservation policy. Reservations were a means to remove the so-called obstacles to progress. That's how our ancestors were referred to, to remove the so-called obstacles to progress from their homelands out of the path of westward expansion and manifest destiny. Thus, the strangers could institute their God-given right to expand democracy and capitalism across this continent.
the world must have changed for our beloved ancestors as they saw their lands slip out of their hands, their places of prayer. Not all Indians went into the agency reservations, however, and so consequently in early December of 1875, the federal government issued orders for the non-compliant Northern Cheyenne, Northern Arapaho, and Lakota to report to their agencies within two months. Otherwise, they would be subjected to military force. The short notice and extreme winter conditions prohibited them from going into the reservation and they consequently had to deal with the United States Army. On a frigid March 1876 morning, Buffalo Calf Road woman arose early as did the blind holy man, Box Elder. The warriors had gone out hunting, leaving the camp with little protection. Suddenly, soldiers under the command of General George Crook called the Three Stars began firing into Chief Old Bear's Northern Cheyenne camp. The people began fleeing and Buffalo Calf Road asked her sister-in-law to take her little daughter, who was called Little Seeker, as she turned to look for her friend, Brave One. She found her and they ran from the village, but as they were running, they saw that a, that a soldier was about to shoot Box Elder our blind holy man. But a warrior stopped him and was shot instead. So Buffalo Calf Road woman pulled her revolver, which she always had tucked into her belt and taking good aim, fired at the soldier and he fell. The three then escaped up the rocky mesa and watched in horror as the crawling white soul, spider soldiers that we call the elk set fire to the village. Even the 1000 dress, as it was called, because it was adorned with 1000 elk teeth. Took a lot of elk since they only have two and each one, but even the 1,000 dress did not escape the burning of their wealth. Then the blue coach drove the Cheyenne pony herd away with them. This attack triggered memories of Sand Creek for Buffalo Calf Road woman. She remembered her mother sent her running for her life away from her Southern Cheyenne family and everything she loved. She ran alone, a little girl and her dear friend, brave one and sister miraculously found her. The three fled North that frigid November 1864 day and wandered a month before reaching the safety and protection of Dull Knife's village. Buffalo Calf Road woman eventually married Black Coyote, a Northern Cheyenne, and lived with the Northerners for the remainder of her life. Well, their chief, Old Bear, decided once they got their horses back that the warriors brought back half of them well he decided that they should go find crazy horse and they walked until nightfall and they spent a bitterly cold night within a stand of willow trees 
and they were so relieved, of course, that their warriors had recaptured half of that pony herd so that the old ones and the young ones and the feeble and the handicapped could ride the horses. They continued toward Crazy Horses Camp and he and his people welcomed them with food and gifts, including lodges, new homes. They then all met in council, deciding not to report to the reservation, but to go join Sitting Bull's camp instead. And they did. And Sitting Bull welcomed them and his people showed their generosity by giving old bears people even more gifts. Buffalo calf road woman got a fine buffalo robe. Black coyote was given a finely made pipe. And little seeker, their daughter received a ball, a beaded ball. And as it goes, the Lakota people began arriving, as did many from the reservations, and their numbers climbed into the thousands. And one day, lame white man and twin woman arrived from south, from Oklahoma Territory, and they brought along comes in sight, who was Buffalo Calf Road woman's brother comes in sight. Years earlier, the brother and sister discovered that each other had survived the attack at Sand Creek. And to ensure their safety, scouts went out daily in all the directions. And one day, Cheyenne scouts hastily returned to report that Three Stars Crook was camped at the Rosebud with some 1,000 soldiers and about 200 Indian scouts. Since Crook had entered their country in violation of their treaty terms, the Lakota and Cheyenne decided to go to war. They made the decision to travel by night and the warriors were ready to leave by sundown. Black Coyote and Comes in Sight were to ride out with two moons when Buffalo Calf Road woman rode up and told them that she was going to go with it. <laughs> of course, this resulted in a great deal of discussion. And finally, the blind holy man, Box Elder, declared that she should go along. Two moons acquiesced and she positioned her black stallion between her husband's horse and her brother's horse. And they rode through the night and stopped at dawn to prepare for battle. The warriors painted their faces and put on their war clothes and their medicines. Buffalo Calf Road woman watched as her husband readied himself for battle. And after her brother painted his face, he put on his bonnet with 100 feathers and picked up his long feathered lance. Buffalo Calf Road woman only had her sixth shooter. They rode up a steep bluff where they met some of Crook's scouts and the battle began. Buffalo Calf Road woman fought all morning and was watching from a bluff when she saw her brother comes in sight in a gap below her. She saw that his horse was shot out from under him and he landed on his feet and he began to run in the ways that snakes crawl. And Crook Shoshone scouts it is said, wrote down the hill to kill him. She kicked her horse into a run, descended into the gap, and quickly rode toward her brother as bullets flew all around her. 
She reached him, turned her horse, and he grabbed her saddle with one hand and the horse's neck with the other, hanging on the side of the horse as they rode away to safety. Later that afternoon, the Cheyenne and the Lakota withdrew with their wounded and dead, knowing that they had stopped three stars and his troops who retreated to camp rather than pursue them. The warriors returned to their village just to perform their usual ceremonies and Buffalo Calf Road Woman was honored for her bravery and given a new name of Otsim He, meaning brave woman. Then furthermore, the Cheyenne renamed this June 13th, 1876 battle, the Battle of the Rosebud, they changed to the battle where the girl saved her brother. That's how we know it today. Well, the Cheyenne and the Lakota eventually moved their village of thousands to the Little Bighorn. It was there on June 25th, 1876, where George Armstrong Custer attacked their village and he and 262 men under his command met their death. Buffalo Calf Road woman fought courageously at the Battle of the Greasy Grass, as it is called, and brought honor to her new name of Ozim He, Brave Woman. The Battle of the Little Bighorn, the Battle of the Greasy Grass, was a significant moment in American Indian history which would never be repeated. The Lakota, Northern Cheyenne, and Northern Arapaho had defeated the 7th Cavalry of the United States military and carried away its guide on as a symbol of victory. But for those First Nations who participated in this battle to preserve their ways of life, it was essentially the beginning of the end and there would be no peace for them. So the battle where the girl saved her brother and the battle of the Little Bighorn are significant historical events that have resulted in strong physical and emotional connections that can never be severed. Today, the Little Bighorn National Monument is a national park, not just a commemoration to the commander who lost his life there, but recognition. of the might and power of some three allied indigenous nations, the Northern Cheyenne, the Northern Arapaho, and the Lakota. And there were some Southern Cheyennes that were there as well. That day in 1876, they asserted their right to live on this earth to maintain their connections to the waters of its mighty rivers and to continue to honor the sacred blue sky. Going back in time a little, seven years earlier, following the massacre at the Washita or the Lodgepole River, Custer and his men relentlessly pursued the Cheyenne to the state plains of Northwest Texas and Eastern New Mexico. And there at the Sweetwater River, he found the arrow keeper named Stone Forehead. He was also called Medicine Arrows for the sacred objects that he kept. So the sacred arrow keeper invited Custer into the arrow teepee to smoke the pipe with him and six Cheyenne chiefs in the presence of the sacred arrows. 
and Custer stated in there that he would never harm the Cheyenne, that he would never point his gun at a Cheyenne again. And then a third time said he would never kill a Cheyenne. Stone forehead, the arrow keeper, cleaned the pipe, positioning the pipe so that some ashes fell on Custer's boot. He then explained to Custer that if he were not being truthful, he and his entire command would become like those ashes. Custer had taken an oath on the pipe, but he again pointed guns at the Cheyenne, thereby violating his oath. We honor the pipe. And further, Custer's interpretation of the Star of the Washita as assurance of his victory was true there, but it was not true at the Little Big Horn. He had smoked in the sacred arrow, the sacred pipe of that keeper and to made some vows that he would never kill another Cheyenne. And seven years later, look what happened to him and his entire command as Stone Forehead had said at the Little Bighorn. The Morning Star stands, as we know, between darkness and light. It is a symbol of hope. Ceremonial people begin their prayers when it appears and signals another day of light. The morning star is important to the Northern Cheyenne Sundance women. On the last day of the dance, she wears the blue outline of a diamond on her face and it's filled in with blue. And that represents the morning star. It is the ceremonial symbol of purity of spirit. And this diamond on her face represents the morning star through which she will forever view life. So the locations of the Sand Creek Massacre, the Battle of the Washita, Bear Butte, the battle where the girl saved her brother and the battle of the Little Bighorn are all places to which the Cheyenne and Arapaho are emotionally and historically attached. They are places of sanctity in the collective memory of the people. And we know that tragic experience is such a Sand Creek and Washita can sometimes be the basis for intergenerational historical trauma that some of our people carry yet today. Nonetheless, even heartbreak has created bonds between a people and the land. In a different time of my life, I worked with the American Indian Religious Freedom Act Coalition for the purpose of amending that piece of legislation, ARFA. American Indian Religious Freedom Act passed in 1978. And one of the four sets of proposed amendments was to protect Indian sacred sites. Essentially, that would mean protecting this entire country. And the public, the, pu the public had no understanding then or now of our relationship to some natural features of the landscape. Those places are sacred. 
some of them. And are our churches, our synagogues, our temples, our mosques, places where indigenous peoples go to pray in the way that we still go to pray at Bear Butte. Indigenous peoples have many such sites across the sacred landscape of our country, most of which are on public lands. Unfortunately, many such sacred sites have been under attack and face one type of development or another, such as oil and gas exploration, oil pipeline construction, like at Standing Rock, mining, logging, recreation, or tourism. Also, many sacred sites of the Tohono O'odham have been des desecrated by the Trump administration's construction of the border wall. Bear Butte is not only a sacred site, but it has been a South Dakota state park since 1961. However, its status as a sacred park, as a state park, does not change its sacred nature. It is still a place of prayer and will forever remain the spiritual center of the Cheyenne universe. Today, development is inching closer to the mountain because of the need for creating the necessary accommodations to meet the growing demands of the annual Sturgis motorcycle rally, which can attract as many as 250,000 people during its 10 day celebration. What is particularly bothersome is the noise pollution or distraction, which is not conducive to spiritual thinking and prayer. Some individuals fasting on Bear Butte have often been disturbed by hikers, despite signs requesting them not to disturb the fasters. Then there's Bear Lodge, Nakove. It is no better known today as Devil's Tower. <clears throat> Bear Lodge is an ancient Lakota Sundance site. It is also a climber's mecca, attracting five to 6,000 climbers annually. In Scott Mamaday, in his book, Way to Rainy Mountain, tells his Kiowa grandmother's story of the tower. She said that seven little girls and their brother were out playing when suddenly the boy was transformed into a bear. The bear pursued his sisters who sought safety on a tree stump, which had called them, and it began to grow out of the bear's reach. The stump grew so high that the girls became the stars of the Big Dipper. And in Scout Mama Day said, and from that point on, we Kiowas know that we have relatives in the sky above. Another sacred site is Big Seated Mountain, known as Mount Graham. For the San Carlos Apache, this mountain is the home of their spirit crown dancers and is the sacred gateway for their prayers. The observatory was originally to be named the Columbus Project. That got changed. And it was funded by four entities, the University of Arizona, Italy, Germany, and the Vatican. 
this gateway of prayers for the Apache is now home to the Mount Graham International Observatory. And then there's Bears Ears in Utah. It is sacred to many nations from the region. In fact, a coalition of five nations comprised of the Diné, Hopi, Ute Mountain Ute, Ute Indian tribes, and the Zuni have battled the Trump administration to maintain the sanctity and the size of that area. They are exercising their responsibilities as stewards of the land, that land. Bears Ears for them is a place of healing, a sacred site that has maintained a connection to the ancestors for 10,000 years. As Cheyenne, sweet medicine assured us that we would live as long as the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the earth if we remembered his teachings. Thus, we continue to pass on his teachings and observe our annual ceremonies so that our children and grandchildren after us will continue to walk this earth. As we know, our descendants too can say, and what we want them to say with certainty and with love, I am earth. You are earth. We are all earth. I am earth. The Cheyenne use earth in all our ceremonies and we return to sacred ground time and time again to pray for strength and direction on our earth journeys. Simply stated, Earth is our altar. That's not just confined to the Cheyennes. Earth is our altar in which we, as the two-legged walkers with five fingers, where we live, it's our altar. And it is from this earth that we send out our prayers to the universe, to the four great directions where the pow powerful spirit beings sit and live. When we each complete our human journey, spirit, our spirit follows the road of the Milky Way to that gigantic encampment on the other side of the Milky Way, where all life, it is said, continues to be lived as it is lived here on earth. Our spirit home exists in infinity, which it shares with all of the stars, other planets, the sun, and the moon. the moon. We know that the cycles of Grandmother Moon reflect the natural rhythms of time and are symbolic of many things, including the four stages of our lives. A new moon represents infancy, the beginning of life. A crescent moon represents adolescence and youth. A full moon represents maturity or adulthood and the age to participate in ceremony. And a waning moon represents elderliness, the age of wisdom, and the end of life. 
I would just like to make a comment about the crescent moon. A Cheyenne Sundance woman, both in the north and the south, forever wears the symbol of a crescent on her back shoulder. That is why, to those that know, you never touch the back of a Sundance woman. There are always a few exceptions. And as we know this earth to be a grandmother, once a woman goes through the sun dance, the ceremony, she becomes a grandmother. That is why in the lone teepee, we just, before they all go, the dancers go into the lodge, the woman's hair is is uh, painted with white paint strips of it to represent becoming a grandmother. Our ancestors and traditional knowledge keepers impress upon us that all life exists in an interconnected, interrelated system. We are related one to another not just as the four different colors of human beings, but to all the peoples who share this awe-inspiring universe, such as all the rooted peoples, the frying, crawling, swimming peoples, the four-legged peoples, the rock peoples, and the earth, water, air, and fire, spirit beings. We are all kinspeople. people who share the cosmos. And on this journey of fires, all across, around this earth circle, we are encouraged to be good relatives. In the Lodge of New Life, the Sundance, Hohuehem, as we call it, the men dance in unison at dawn to greet the sun as it begins its daily journey to travel across the sky. And when the dance is over, people stand in line to drink the healing water from either a male or a female sun dancer's bucket. The last time I went into the Hohoyam, the Sundance priest acknowledged me as the oldest sun dancer in both the North and the South. That was when I was 82 years of age. So we drink this healing water, for we know that water is life. And then the dancers return home, content in the knowledge that through, through their prayer dance, the world has been renewed. We do this annually, every year. And then when the sun dance is over, the members of the spiritual community continue their duties and wait to see that morning star so they can begin their daily prayers, which brings another day of life and hope, the kind of hope that we and our relatives need today in this time that we live. So that is the 86 year journey, nearly 87 year journey that I have been on from the waters that nourished me, the Washita River and to the waters of life that I have drunk in the sun dance and the prayers that I give on this altar of earth. 
and the air that we breathe from the four directions. The air that we carry within us and the fire of life. That is my journey to today. And I wish to thank you for being such a wonderful audience, even though I can't see you. But I wish you a long life, good health, a long, happy journey of life. Now, Shem Nahinaani. Thank you. Oh, what beautiful words and what a beautiful story. I'm, I'm just totally overwhelmed by your words, the, the images that come to my mind as you tell these stories of these beautiful ancestors. And they're, they're just such significant connections to the earth. And my hope is that anybody that's listening that has a role to play in stewardship of the earth, which is people from the national parks, national monuments, forest service, fish and wildlife, that you will take these words and the messages and the stories with you as you make your decisions for your agencies and know that that this isn't these aren't just this isn't just soil this isn't just a place it is so connected so so connected to the people um and and that reverence and awe and wisdom will be something that will last within in your hearts and minds for many many years to come thank you thank you auntie i cannot tell you how happy i am to hear your words today it was my honor niece nancy <laughs> it's all of our honors to have listened to you <laughs> at this point i'm going to turn it over to um dr polly walker who is our chair for the Indigenous um, Education Institute. Um, we, we don't have time for many questions, but we may have um, one or two. Anyway, I will turn this over to Polly. Wado, thanks, Nancy. Dr. Mann, Wado Gariega. Thank you, I am so grateful for your powerful and beautiful knowledge and wisdom that you've shared with us today. And I will pose just one or two questions. Um, you can let me know if you think we have a full enough uh, time after just one question, we can also end there. So our first question for you would be that this series of IEI talks focuses on indigenous perspectives of land and sky. Would you please explain the role of stewardship of native peoples in relationship to the natural world? Thank you for that question, Dr. Walker. Now you can use the context of what I have shared with you as a backdrop to what I have to say. There are many individuals that look upon our stories, our, our stories that relate to the beginning of life uh, as, oh, stories that just entertain children. What relevance do they have? Well, they are as sacred to us as Genesis is in the book of Genesis, uh, as creation is in the book of Genesis. So in our creation account, after Mahil had, had created all that he did, the, he, First of all, he created those four sacred beings to watch over creation, to watch over earth, and to be there to assist us as these human beings that he made and called children. And he looked at this wondrous creation that we live with. And Mahil thought with the heart and with the mind that earth was the most beautiful of everything that makes up our home. 
grand, he said, let the earth be known as our grandmother for us as Cheyenne people. And Ma'il, at the beginning of the creation story, was alone with the void. And it was then that Ma'il decided to create the earth. And looking at earth, Ma'il said, I do not want earth to be alone like I was once, alone with the void. She needs to have people that will live with her all the time. And Ma'il first created a man person and a woman person and stationed the man in the south and the woman person in the north. And although the woman has white hair, she never grows older and the man stays young and his assistants are, are rain, and thun, uh, rain and thunder. And the woman's assistant is winter person, winter man, oh, and Ma -ha, or Wook. And these two beings alternately come across this land. They never stay with each other. They meet and they say, go back, go back to where you live. I wish to put grandmother earth to sleep and, and cover her with a blanket of snow. So we know that it's winter and uh, fall and winter time. And then spring man comes with his assistance and tells grandmother earth and winter man to move back because he wants to cover them with green grass and wants things to grow, animals and all things here. Those two beings were so powerful, they could not live together. And Mahil decided to create human beings for the sole purpose of keeping grandmother earth company and for protecting the earth. Protecting the earth. So you, if you look at our creation accounts, they contain and body, they embody our ways of life. And so Mahil told those sacred powers to have pity upon them and protect them, but he told the human beings that Mahil loved that had been created to live on the earth to not only keep grandmother company, Mahil wanted them to protect this beautiful earth, everything on it, in it, above it, all around it, to protect their grandmother, which is just a very simple but profound way of saying they were given the protection of earth to live in balance and in harmony with this place, this beautiful place that we call home, to protect this grandmother, to not desecrate her in any fashion in much the same way that we see the kind of development occurring with the laying of oil pipelines or, or looking for oil and digging around, as we say, in, in her bones and for val valuable metal for that gold stone that might help put in many places on earth. And so with that very simple command, they, Mahil said, you protect and watch over this earth in much the same way that those sacred spirit uh, powers are gonna watch over and protect you. So he, he gave us as human beings responsibility for caring for our mother, the earth in every way imaginable to live as lightly on her as if we are walking on fragile seashells to, to not exploit her, to not 
desecrate or violate her by constant resource development to make sure that her trees continue to grow so that we can have the oxygen that we need to breathe, that, that, we, that we live as responsible human beings with this land, this earth that is our mother, our grandmother. This is certainly contrary to what has occurred in these past centuries and what is occurring today and which we really must honor in terms of impending climate change and global warming. And I think we have a decade to change our ways or else to retain and rekindle those responsibilities of living in harmony and in balance and with respect for this beautiful, beautiful creation that we call Earth. So we have to make sure that we teach our young people to assume their responsibilities and stewardship for this place in much the same way that our ancestors wanted us to live lightly, lovingly, with compassion and love for this earth and to love this earth in much the same way that we love our grandmother to protect this earth in the same way that we would protect our human grandmothers. Holly, you're muted. <laughs> Much is so relevant for our series of talks, and as you said, for addressing the most pre pressing issues that all of us are facing. And I would love to ask you another question. I'm also cognizant that you have shared your experience and wisdom with us for about an hour and a half. So I just want to ask you, do you want another question or would you like to wrap it up here? I think uh, if you don't mind, I think my my voice and my old mind, my 86 year old mind, I think have said enough for today. And I hope that you all understand that. Go and find your elders in your communities where you work, where you live. Take some offerings if you're going to go and ask them for advice. Go and sit at their feet, honor them, ask them to share their knowledge with you. They will share, they will give, but you be respectful and exercise that aspect of reciprocity. We are human beings. We are loving, kind, compassionate peoples. So those of you that work in tribal communities are blessed, beyond blessed, go to know those elders and those nations for, with whom and for whom you work, they will share with you. There is a great deal of knowledge that, that they have. We don't know all the answers in the world. We don't, some of us don't know how to navigate the world of technology as well as you do, but make use of that world of technology and your research skills to go on the web, to locate your sources, to find, for example, the Macaw uh, Climate Mitigation Plan and help those nations develop their own. We're only talking about 10 years. Time is critical. So come together with the first environmentalists of this land that is our only home, blue planet Earth. Thank you so much for your words. Um, I wish this could go on all day. I want to come down and sit at your feet. <laughs> but I want to come and sit by your water. <laughs> <laughs> Always welcome. And I just want to um, thank you so much for, we're just so honored that you came and shared with us today. Um, so many, many thanks. Um, 
to close this up, I'd also like to thank our technical specialists, um, Chris Taren, Christopher Taren, and Chris Hout. And um, just think, the coyote did not come in today and disrupt everything like has happened before. So um, thank you for all your um, technical expertise in setting this up. Um, I also want to extend my thanks to uh, Marcia de Chardonnay, who was the former superintendent of the U.S. Uh, National Monuments in um, the San Juan Islands, and also Alexis Freedy and Joe Dolan from the United States National Parks up here in the San Juan Islands for their support and um, enthusiasm for this series. I also want to thank um, NASA's NASA HEAT group, the NASA HEAT Activation Group for your support of this series. Um, and I really want to thank all of you in the audience that stayed with us um, this afternoon. And I'm just so happy that you had a chance to listen to one of our really renowned elders. I think it's just been a, um, a blessing and a, and a wonderful time to be spending with um, Henrietta Mann. Um, we are recording all of the series, so this series, this um, event has been recorded, and as I said before, it will be available at the Indigenous Education Institute um, org website, and you can listen to it over and over, or you can have your friends come in and listen to it too. And the other five speakers, they have their um, speeches also recorded and available there. Um, we will send an email out to you just after this presentation with a very short survey. And if you can answer the questions and get them back to us, we'd greatly appreciate it because we use your, your questions and your comments to, um, to create further speaker opportunities. And since there wasn't time to have um, all of the question Q and A's that I see floating in down at the bottom of my screen. Um, if you will take the time to answer the survey, you'll have you'll have a space to put in your comments and observations. Um, one last thing, we will be getting back to you about our next speaker in this series, um, who will come um, present in June. Um, we are still confirming it, but it's, it'll be an exciting um, presentation and we'll let you know as soon as it's confirmed. And from um, the San Juan Islands and from uh, Oklahoma and from Navajo Nation and from Pennsylvania and wherever else you are from, we send you our best wishes. Have a happy day and spend time pondering on these very important issues that um, our grandmother, our auntie has brought up. So many thanks to you all and thanks for being with us. Goodbye.